Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Bowman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I want to welcome you to this webinar presentation on warehouse operations have gotten more complex than ever, how technology enables operational agility, presented by Generex Group with the participation of TLS. One quick reminder, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their, miss submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Now, global supply chain disruption is the new reality now. The ability to anticipate change and adapt to it swiftly is becoming key to business success. Technology, of course, is also key, but what does operational agility mean when it comes to warehouse activities? Today, we're going to learn about the changing reality of today's warehousing operations and hear some real life examples of success. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Emmanuel Langlois is Vice President, Global Alliances and Partners at Generix Group. Emmanuel has previously served as Executive Vice President for Solo Globe, which was acquired by Generix Group to become its North American division. He has also been an officer in the Canadian Army, where he specialized in Army logistics and participated in many missions around the world. Harish Kumar is Senior Operations and Continuous Improvement Manager at Emblem Logistics Limited. Harish has demonstrated success in business management and organizational leadership within the service, supply chain, transportation, warehouse, and distribution and aviation industries. And Aaron LeBlanc is Vice President of Operations at Thomas Large & Singer, Inc., TLS. Aaron is logistics, engineering, and IT professional with over 15 years' experience in supply chain and IT. So with that, I want to turn it over to Emmanuel Langlois. Emmanuel, take it away. Thank you, Bob, for the introduction. So I'm Emmanuel Langlois, Vice President of Generic. So... Uh, Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so today we'll uh, be talking about uh, the changing reality of today's warehouse operation. How a modern, adaptable, intuitive WMS uh, is uh, can support the, the new reality. And we'll finish with TLS, a real life example of a successful uh, WMS implementation uh, with the uh, for sure participation of Aaron and Amish. Um, so as Bob mentioned, the reality today is very different than it used to be. Disruption is the new normal. Things are changing so fast. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, things are, are uh, impacting the uh, the supply chain. Uh, when you look, example, at COVID, COVID has changed a lot of things in terms of behavior, how people buy, has changed a lot of things also in terms of the e-commerce that has been booming like crazy during that time. And that has definitely impacted a lot in terms of inventory visibility, inventory forecasting, uh, suppliers, uh, supply chain disruption, uh, and, and definitely all those has put a lot of impact on how warehouse and distribution center works. There's also new trends, and this is uh, some uh, uh, data that comes from the last Gartner conference in uh, Orlando in May. Uh, clearly, there's behavior in terms of uh, expectation from the buyers, the uh, new uh, generation example, there will be more and more need for customized product, uh, more and more uh, expectation also in terms of social responsibility product and services. So that also create changes and, and new challenges for the supply chain. Another big, big aspect of today's reality, and this is true for, I mean, a lot of my customers are talking about this being a very, very important issue is the labor shortage, okay? Labor availability, finding the people to work in the warehouse, finding the people to make sure you can operate three shifts, 24 hours, seven days a day, uh, seven days a week. Very challenging. And when you look at example automation, used to be a lot about labor costs, all we can save labor. Now we see a lot of trends in terms of automation, investing in robotics, conveyor, all kind of technology that is available right now that is actually motivated by making sure that they can run the operation. So labor availability, okay? So very, very key. 
So when you look at all the different factors, there's definitely, I mean, a, a, a trend in terms of proximity versus scale, uh, small local versus big remote, omni-channel, omnidirection uh, from uh, any anywhere to anywhere, uh, through the e-commerce, through the uh, normal retail. So a lot of omni-channel challenges, economics, uh, inflation, raising costs, transportation, we mentioned labor shortage, so clearly a big trend in terms of automation, but also in terms of labor, managing labor, labor engagement, and, and the technology that is available out there. This is uh, definitely uh, uh, a lot of creating a lot of opportunities in terms of addressing those challenging time with available technology. So what does it mean for the warehouse in terms of agility? Uh, and this is a slide I like a lot. Uh, through 2026, uh, there will be more changes, more innovation uh, in the new generation of WMS than what happened in the last 25 years, okay? So we definitely see a lot of trend in terms of a new generation of WMS that address the new reality of today's logistics and distribution, okay? So some example of that. We mentioned that things are more difficult in terms of predictive inventory visibility, uh, 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 supply chain uh, changes that occur in a very fast way. So clearly the, there's a need for better intelligence, better use of data to ensure we have better way of, of, of being a lead, of leadership, okay? We mentioned labor shortage. So clearly there's a need also or, or a lot of uh, opportunities in terms of how we manage the labor. So there's a new generation of labor management system that are uh, being available today, working with WMS. And lastly, the uh, automation. Uh, clearly, uh, there's new uh, technology available today that are, uh, I mean, uh, providing real value with very interesting uh, return on investment. Okay. So when you put this in different pieces, and again, this is a, a definition of Gartner's, they come up with a new terminology, which is warehouse operation management. The warehouse operation management is composed of the, what we traditionally, you know, the traditional WMS, a warehouse management system with all the normal functions from receiving, put away, picking, cycle counting, shipping, packing, et cetera. There's the warehouse execution system that is more looking at integrating different pieces of technology, uh, being robotics, being co intelligent conveyor, Working very closely with the warehouse control system, uh, integrating all the different pieces of technology and orchestrating everything in terms of uh, uh, execution. There's the warehouse planning and analytics, uh, leveraging data, leveraging analytics, leveraging uh, uh, also not only data from the, the WMS itself, but data from the supply chain, data from your partners, suppliers, customers. And I mentioned labor becoming very key. Uh, so there's a new generation of warehouse labor management that provide all kinds of tools to attract, engage, and uh, keep the, your people. So when you look at what's, on, uh, what's out there in terms of, uh, we mentioned re uh, warehouse resource planning and op optimization. So definitely a lot of new tools. Uh, also a big trend is the, what we call microservices. So, uh, this is pretty much, I, I like to use the Lego blocks example as different functionality within the WMS or extended WMS, i.e. being the labor management, uh, warehouse control system, or the analytics, which are uh, actually uh, microservices that can be connected together. And I use Lego block as easy way to uh, connect those pieces together. Workforce optimization, new generation of warehouse labor management, to attract people, retain people, engage people. Uh, definitely uh, uh, worker in the warehouse are expecting, you know, modern technology, modern interface, intuitive interface, graphical interface, but also they're expecting a way of, you know, uh, being involved in, in, in a team type of uh, 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 targets or, or, or uh, even gratification. Uh, we call it also, there's a buzzword out there, gamification. And finally, everything around automation, robotics, this is very, very key. 
Uh, another important uh, uh, thing, because we're being asked always that question is, is the cloud adoption. So cloud adoption has been, uh, it's been out there for a while uh, and really uh, solution now that are being provided as software as a service during the pandemic has seen a, a very high grow. Uh, now today, I mean, 70, and this is market numbers, 70% of all the new deals in terms of the WMS are cloud-based WMS. And that represents, as of today, about a third of all the WMS deployed uh, in North America, okay? And then another aspect is, I used to all, I mean, often, not often, but once in a while, I have you know, people in front of me saying, no, never, I'll never be on the cloud, you know, for the question about data, data security, et cetera. Now we see that argument as being very less and less, and only 10% of now, pretty much organization or people are just saying, yeah, I'll never be on the cloud. So big trend. Another uh, interesting aspect coming again from Gartner is the change from functionality to architecture in terms of what people expect in the WMS. Okay, and this is a very important sentence where, you know, to 2025, technical architecture will be equal to functionality and importance for new buyers uh, of WMS seeking flexibility, adaptability, composability. We talked about microservices, usability, and affordability. Okay, so it used to be a lot about function. Now we're saying that function is still important, but architecture, infrastructure, technology is becoming as important. Okay, and there's a new generation of WMS and microservices leveraging all kinds of technology that address those needs and answer all this requirement around flexibility, adaptability, and composability, and usability. So clearly, when you look at the functionality, there's a lot of things around now, usability, maintainability, extensibility, composability. It's a lot about technology, okay? So uh, uh, definitely, this become key in terms of your WMS and all the other extended function around being labor management, warehouse integration, warehouse control system. So some example, we talk about usability, adaptability, composability, uh, another aspect, implementation technology. Uh, so those are examples of intuitive, uh, very graphical interface, uh, this is an example of a dock management when you will assign trailers to dock uh, doors and also assign the different orders that need to be consolidated at the door or also uh, uh, plan all the task of loading a trailer or unloading a trailer, managing the yard, very graphical. You can have this on a tablet, drag and drop. So a shipping manager, shipping uh, um Director could be, you know, walking on the floor with his tablet and pretty much interact with how he wants to organize his dock, how he wants to organize the shipping uh, uh, schedule and everything. Uh, and, and that goes to how we want to load a truck, how we want to load a trailer, very graphical. This is an example of a, what we call a warehouse 2D. Uh, warehouse management system is a lot about physical location, you know, aisle, bin, bay, uh, receiving dock, shipping dock, packing table. So a lot of uh, the information has to do about what is being done, where, by who, for which reason. So representing that information on a 2D model with different color code, we call it heat map, makes all this information easy to look at, easy to, to consume, easy to understand. Then you can drill down and go see, oh, why this area is red? Boom. Oh, we're late on that shipment. Oh, let's reassign resources so we can expedite that order. So we're, you know, making all the timings that are planned based on the shipping schedule. So very, very useful, very uh, uh, modern way of representing information, but clearly uh, 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 provide a lot of value. And that's an example of a heat map with different color code. Uh, representing the, uh, the the warehouse operation. Another aspect uh, that is very key in terms of usability and configurability is the mobile processes. Uh, you have today ways of building workflow that really makes the operation in terms of mobility very optimized. And if there's a place you really want this to be 
optimize in terms of simplicity and usability is the mobile processors because 80% of users of WMS will be mobile users, people receiving, people put away, cycle counting, picking, shipping, and you want them to do their work in the most efficient way, but you want them also to be like very easy to use, very step-by-step, -step, do this, do that, with very you know, real-time feedback, real-time, yes, you can do it, no, you cannot do it, be careful about this, be careful about that. So that workflow configuration is very key in terms of flexibility and usability. And this is an example of a workflow configurator where you can actually build the workflow based on different business rules, based on different validation. So clearly, there's always, and I always tell my people, there's always a complexity in the warehouse operation. So the complexity need to be managed behind the scenes, but in terms of what's happening in the ends of the user has to be simple, has to be step-by-step, step, okay? We manage the complexity, we make it easy for the user to execute. Another example of a, a, how, you know, modern visual technology uh, 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 interface uh, allows to better consume information or look for information, uh, traceability. When you look at traceability from ingredient to finished good with all the different transformation process in the middle, we have what we call ascendant and descendant traceability from ingredient to finished good, finished good to ingredient. We used to capture, in order to do that, you need to capture a lot of information. It was very challenging in terms of where you were doing, example, a recall, mock-up recall, to actually find out where's the problem in terms of where's that ingredient, where that ingredient was used for which finished good, where are that finished good are, either being still in the warehouse, been shipped to a customer. So we have this dynamic way of from ingredient, finished good, finished good to ingredient, being able to move around, drill down, drill out, drill up, and find out exactly very quickly where is the problem. And then from there, you can quickly uh, execute a recall, uh, freezing material or the inventory, uh, sending email to suppliers that already received those goods. Very interactive. Uh, we have customers that used to take hours to do recall. And now in a few minutes, they can actually not only detect and then datafy, but execute. And that is key. Very key. So again, very modern interactive interface. Same thing, another example here, uh, managing security by role, very visual, used to be very cumbersome, takes a lot of time. Now you can navigate through the menu, submenu, and say, okay, I want those people to be able to do this, boom, boom, boom. Show me their uh, right to do, to view, their right to edit. Very, very easy to look at, very easy to maintain. We save hours, not only creating all those uh, uh, security profile, but also managing it because it change almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Very visual. And for sure, we mentioned analytics, very key using the data to provide better information, better predictivity, uh, better uh, 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 information also that you share to your supply chain partners, being suppliers, being uh, uh, customers or, or 3PL that you deal with. So a lot of data, a lot of ways of uh, of showing the data to uh, uh, key key uh, KPIs or managing dashboard uh, dashboard or, or, or actionable dashboard also very key where you can look at information drill down see where the there's an issue or a problem uh, very uh, very modern uh, way of representing a lot of data. I'll finish with implementation tool because it's key. Why? Now that WMS provides very, very, a lot of flexibility, a lot of configurability, and then you adapt on a day-to-day basis, uh, all, all, all the way you want the WMS to manage your operation, the way you want to, uh, you change a picking task to address a new customer requirement, you have new requirements for new labels, new reports. Flexibility comes with the price, uh, I mean, can be dangerous, i.e., you can quickly, if you don't do it under control, create just a chaotic system, okay? So this is why implementation rule is important because you need to be able to really centrally document all your system is configured, maintain your system in terms of configuration, but also in terms of testing, okay? So you'll organize everything in terms of use case, uh, uh, called feature and the feature you'll have some different uh, use case uh, a feature could be receiving against a PO use case is what happened when there's too much what happened when it's not the right skew what happened when it's damaged and everything is organized with very 
clear nomenclature of how you name things. And then you document everything in this uh, implementation tool that is a very a central collaborative tool that is being used by all the people involved in the project. And not only during the implementation, during the full life cycle of that product, because I can tell you something, the day you're done, you're done with implementing a WMS at Go Live, the next day you'll do changes. The next month you will have changes. Now you're never done making your WMS uh, evolve. Okay, so that implementation collaborative platform is really the central database. It's a collaborative database where you not only you organize the information, but this is where you maintain everything. And when it's time to test, this is also where you test all the test scenario. When it's time to train, this is where you will generate all the user manual for training and everything is always up to date. I've seen so many projects spending lots of time, lots of money to write nice document and a month after the go live, it's already obsolete, okay? So now that we have those flexible, highly configurable system, now that we need to change and evolve the system on a day-to-day -day basis because of new challenges, new requirement, new customer, having a very solid implementation and documentation and collaborative platform becomes key to keep things under control, okay? So I'll finish with this. Uh, and those are examples of testing and things. And I want again to say, this is a very slide I like a lot. Expect a lot of changes in the next five years in terms of WMS capability because of the technology that is available now out there, but also because there's a need. Things are more complex than ever. So you need to have to better use technology in order to make sure that not only you deal with this new reality, but you keep also a leadership position. Okay. So with that, I will leave now the... Uh, the, the to Aaron that will continue with the TLS uh, case study. Hey everybody, hope you can hear me. Um, so again, I'm I'm with TLS. Uh, so Thomas Large and Singer, based out of Toronto here in Canada, but we do service the North American market. So we have a large presence in the U.S. as well. We do it mainly through our main distribution center here in Toronto, which is Emblem Logistics. Again, it's a food safe warehouse, about six hundred thousand square feet where we actually implemented solo chain back in 2021, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, but we do a lot of business as well in the United States through our 3PL partners. So I'm gonna take you a little bit through the history of kind of how we got to where we are today. And then I'll turn it over to Harish in a few slides. Uh, but back in 2018, the executive team here at TLS decided that, hey, part of our strategic, um, our st basically our value chain proposition was we need to have better data quicker so that we could share it with our partners. I, again, on the value chain side of things, everybody's, everybody wants data, everybody's hungry for data, and they want it in bite-sized chunks and they want it when they want it. And, and now basically they wanted it yesterday. So what we decided as an executive team was basically, hey, we need to go out, we need to put it in a modern ERP and a best-in-class WMS. So back in 2019, we, we, we kind of put an RFP together, went out to the market, went through kind of a lot of the best in breeds and we chose solo chain, solo chain back in 2019. So we had a, a quick off in 2019, we formed a team, we're gonna go live early Q2, Q3. Um, and then something happened about, something we call the pandemic happened in early 2020. So right when we were getting ready to go live, there was a number of people on our team as well as an Eric team that actually came down with, with COVID, that pushed it. We went into lockdowns here in the Toronto area, which meant it was you know essential workers only on site. Which, no offense to our friends at Generics, meant they weren't meant they weren't really allowed on site. We didn't even want our head office on site because at that point in time, we really didn't know, you know, what was coming. So on the Generics team on their side, they weren't able to travel to Toronto. You know, on top of that, we were in lockdown in Toronto, so people stopped going to restaurants. They kept going to the grocery stores because realistically, that was all that was open for a period of time and. 2020, early 2020, and second half of 2020. Um, so our volumes went way up. So realistically, we said we cannot go live. We're not ready to go live. We don't. We, we're not ready to do this. So we postponed it. Um, so the next question is: Okay, if we're not ready to go live now, we don't know when we're going to go live because we don't know when the pandemic is going to end. We don't know. Honestly, we didn't know. We didn't know. We didn't know when the volumes were going to come back to normal. We didn't know when generics was going to be able to travel. We didn't know when we were going to let some of our clients and customers into our warehouses. 
So um, to be frank with you, the generics team came to us and said, we have a great idea. We're doing this with some of our other customers. And, you know, we're going to do, we're going to pitch a remote go live. Um, let's just say that I was a little bit hesitant to say, to, to take that on initially. Um, I've done, uh, fortunately over a hundred go lives and or a hundred different WMS go lives across the country in Canada and in the U S. Um, and it was the first time any, anybody ever proposed to me to go live with uh, a remote team. So, uh, we actually sat down with the generics team, you know, every question we answered, we asked, they had an answer. We were a little bit nervous, but to be frank with you, they convinced us it was, uh, it was a slight change in approach that we need to go to. It was a lot more training and a lot more responsibility on the on-team site, which we'll see in a few minutes. But realistically, if we wanted to go live, that was the only option we had. So they pitched it kind of in, I think it was an early Q4 2020. And we said, you know what? We need to make a leap of faith. Let's make it happen. So Jan January 9, 2021 was the date we, we uh, decided we we're gonna go live. Sorry. Um, so just to set the stage a little bit, from a go-live planning perspective, we um, we also had, uh, we were coming from a paper-based environment, so we really didn't even have a wireless network in the warehouse. So we had to install a wireless network. We didn't have any infrastructure as far as computers on the floor. All that was kind of done in the shipping and operations offices. So we had to install all that information. We didn't even have barcodes at the time on our pallets or even on our racking. Our racking was named, but it wasn't barcoded. So we were coming from an environment which was really paper-based to a all RF environment or a mainly RF environment. And we were doing again this remotely uh, with the sorry, with the solo chain or generics team remotely. And our on-team site was taking responsibility for getting everything done. So we always had what we call the super users that were being trained. And those were going to be the guys and gals that knew more than the average person in the warehouse on how to use. The, the WMS, you know, we had a shipping super user, we had a receiving super user, we had a loading super, we had a number of different super users out there. But realistically, this approach meant we needed to kind of have what we, we deem the super duper users. They were really the people that honestly understood the configuration, obviously don't have enough, um, we didn't have as much experience as the solo chain team did or generics team did on how to do configuration, but they needed to understand enough about the configuration, not do it, but understand enough about it so that they understood it. the SOPs, the configuration, if something went bump in the night, how do we escalate? How do we go through all that? Um, so we spent a lot of time kind of in late Q4, early Q1, uh, early, early Q1 to get the super duper users up to speed. And then the super duper users actually was doing the training of the super users. So then the super users could then go out and train the trainer. So it was a, it was a different approach than we had originally planned. However, it worked out extremely well. Solo chain was with us the whole way through. Uh, again, from a go live support perspective, it was a completely remote go live, both from the generics team. So they were based in Montreal. We had our on team site on, on our on team was on our on site team was in the warehouse 24 seven. Our IT team, other than our infrastructure team, they were remote as well. We didn't honestly want any outside visitors in the warehouse again from a, from a COVID perspective. Uh, we did have our infrastructure team in because we needed them in there. It was new technology. And then we went live on, on the 9th. So I'll talk to that in a second. But that's where really, you know, we had a 24-hour hotline to generics. Uh, we were on, actually, we had an iPad. We were on, on call 24-7. Sorry, they were on call 24-7. We had a hotline open 24-7. If anything went bump in the night, we actually just logged a ticket, got on the phone, said, please fix, and they fixed it. Um, and again, I'm going to talk about the, the actual go live, and I'll hand this off to Harish after this. But the actual go live is, is very standard go live. Again, I've been through a number of them. You know, it was really about shutting down the old WMS, converting the inventory to be able to, to import it into solo chain. We didn't have barcode, so that caused us a couple of different consternations. We knew what inventory we had by location, but it wasn't barcoded, and we have double deeps, so and there's some challenges around that. Um, you know, the IT conversion was relatively straightforward. Again, our team working with the generics team worked uh, kind of, we worked through the night, got it all done. So we, we closed down kind of end of business day on Friday around 6 p.m. And by Saturday morning, it was around nine o'clock. We were ready to actually load it. Uh, inventory had been loaded. We were actually doing cycle counts to validate that the inventory loaded them properly. We did our test receipts. We did our test shipping and we were ready to go. We were off to the races. Now with that, I'm going to hand it off to Harish.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Harish. I'm working with Emblem Logistics, which is basically the subsidiary of Thomas Larger and Singer. So Emblem Logistics is where the complete warehousing and distribution is done. As um, Erin had explained, yes, we decided to go live just maybe a few weeks before January. And with that, we understood that there is a lot of different challenges. We had to change the strategy, what we had, and completely look at other better way to ensure the operation runs as smoothly as possible. Some of the challenges what we did experience as soon as we went go live was that, um, as I said, we had super users who were supposed to be on the floor to manage the team. But since Generics was not available at the warehouse and we had to decide to go with the remote go live, we had to ensure that the super users are now training additional users who will be called as super users who can really look into the floor. And this, this super users would be the one who would be kind of control tower, managing all the issues and problems which the floor cannot handle it. And then they would be directing this to um, generic support team who was available 24 by seven. Um, with all this, yes, we knew that there were some other lot of challenges because as we mentioned, we were a company which was completely manual. We have employees who have been in the company for more than 30, 40 years who has been always using manual uh, pen and papers. Now, when we have them to be trained on technology, it was some of challenges what we were experiencing. So what we did is that we did a training four weeks prior to the go live and after that, we had a refresher training again for all the super users, as well as the end users. Then the super duper users used to go back and sit with all the end users on daily basis for half an hour to one hour and go through each different remote functions on the handheld. Again, as we all know that end of the day, if your business has to be successful, it is basically your people, <clears throat> again, your people who are down on the floor. Um, so if they have understood the concept very well, then you know that you're overseeing very less issues as we go live. So we had continuous refresher trainings. We had back-to-back uh, -back refresher training assessments, which are done to understand their knowledge. And that was one of the things. Second thing, one of the challenge what we made is change management. So change management, as you guys know, is very important that all the information what you are doing has to be shared across to the entire team. So what we did is that, yes, we were very good in communicating it to generics had the information with regards to the SOPs. Yes, our warehouse team had the information with regards to that. But yes, as change management part of time, we had our head office, which completely looks into our supply chain, our customer care, and all those departments who completely handles the logistics team. So information needs to be communicated well across to them. What information is basically, yes, we decided to go with very less inbound during go live and bring maximum inventory before go live. So we can mainly focus on shipping and we can ensure that all the trailers are rotated and dispatched to the retailers as per the appointment time. So change management part of that, communicating widely to all the department is something very, very essential. Maintaining a document is another one challenge which we found initially was difficult for us because we used to have SOPs. Now the SOPs were fine-tuned. And then after that, we found that the SOPs which is available on the files, on the paperwork, is not readily available for the end users on the floor. So we had to kind of make a cheat sheet, laminate it, give it to the people so they can just have it with their um, name badge. So whenever they are confused with anything, then they can have a look at it. Um, then another very important thing is that with pandemic, with all the retail shops, um, limited to the number of people, the employer, employees was a very difficult challenge. So yes, we used to have employees who used to come for work, but yes, with the pandemic condition, if they're not feeling well, they had to be sitting home for 14 days, 15 days. So we need backup 
of new people available who are trained. So continuously having backup of new people, which have been sent by our external outsource agencies, we need to ensure that we have temporary logins created for them. So they come in board, they don't have to wait for the login to be created. We create a lot of temporary logins. We have been able to roll out those logins as soon as they come in, go with the cheat sheet, focus them with one area of the job, what they would be doing instead of training them inbound and outbound and uh, put away and picking and all that, just dedicate them to one specific area. So having a user access available to be created easily without the dependency of um, generic support team was something very, very important, which we felt during the pandemic. Um, so that really helped us a lot um, to ensure that any staff is not feeling well and has not come in, the backup staff comes in, and then we have people who are already trained. They just use the train login and they continue to work. So the operation doesn't have to stop. Um, again, with the pandemic, one of the expectation was that yes, with the retails, with social distancing and all those things, we expected the outbound to be low. That was not really the case. There was a high outbound requirement. Yes, e-com platform also was very high demanding. We were not into e-com during those time, but we expected that all our retailers, the number of orders which would be coming in would be very less. So we had reduced the inbound, but that was not the reality. We found a high demand on the outbound at the retails as well. Yes, when pandemic people were ordering, overstocking their house, overstocking with all the uh, consumer package, packaged goods. So that made us into a kind of challenge of bringing in the inbound much more earlier than what we had force vision. With generics back in hand, what they were being able to do for us is that, as I didn't mention, we had a lot of locations which were barcoded based on inbound and outbound. So now all of a sudden outbound demand has increased. At the same time, we had to bring inbound and that means we wanted more space. Understanding with all the different reports what we have, which I'm gonna to talk to you in a few minutes in the next slide, we were being able to identify that how much space is available in our inbound and then we could switch them over to outbound. It is normally a very tedious process. With the 24 by seven support, what we had, our super duper users were being able to just go and speak to Generex. Generex were being able to pull up a report and they were being able to identify how much space we have in inbound, which is underutilized because of high demand. And they flipped it us for us an outbound staging area. Um, so reports. So everyone knows that, you know, when we go live, we do a lot of before go live also when we are part of testing and all that we look into different kinds of reports. We see all the reports, what is required, and we know that the reports is fine. Some of the reports, which was earlier shared by uh, Bob as well, like, you know, you have fabulous reports which are available. We have a BI tool, which is basically our business intelligence tool where we can slice and dice the report as we require. So basically you can convert all the reports which is there in solo chain from Excel to PDF or something. You can, um, then we use our BI tool, convert it and slice and dice what we want. But however, what happens is that one of the thing which we didn't oversee at that point of time, there are certain informations which you will have to access two different reports. And those two different reports needs to be then later on merged together in the BI tool to get the respective information. Um, so as we moved into our second week, we really wanted to understand where do we stand? So a lot of reports were available for us, easily pulled from the solo chain system. Um, but however, they had to be again, customized to exactly get into the integrity of what we require, what we want to share it to the supervisors and shift managers so they can go back and focus on those areas with the team to move the operations really well. Um, yes, um, as I said, like, you know, with the 24 by seven support, what we had with SoloChain, 
Some of them we learn in the classroom. Some of them we have a cheat sheet available in that. We have documents, fabulous and all that. When we run into kind of challenges, it won't click for us immediately. So that time when you have people who are readily available, even with the remote thing, you could just go into Teams, just put in a chat, you know what, I'm lost at this area. Can you help me? And they were being able to prepare it for us, provide to us immediately when we wanted it. Um, what did we learn? As part of continuous improvement, um, there are a lot of things what we learned. Um, sorry, there are a lot of things what we learned. And one of the thing is that first we need to decide of going small and then grow big. We cannot be thinking of hitting high numbers in the beginning. We should go slow. So that is one of the thing what we did is that we reduced the inbound. We didn't want to keep the inbound the same way how the outbound is expected. We know we couldn't control the outbound, but we could kind of control the inbound. So we decided to go slow, even though people were continuously trained. Uh, there was com continuous refresher trainings and all those things. So one of the recommendations is yes, go slow and then grow big. Um, some changes what we did, yes, from a manual world to an uh, WMS environment was good, but was not so much as we expected. So when it comes to the SOPs, yes, we were been able to make the SOPs before the go live. We made the SOPs, we were made it available, but just few days before go live, what we noticed is that when the staffs are getting a little confused, the reference document for the SOPs are not something which they would be able to easily go through. So we had to make a kind of cheat sheet for them, especially for the end users on the floor, which if it is picking, they can just take the cheat sheet, flip it on the backside of the laminated one, look at it at, okay, this is where I'm stuck. This is what I should do. So that is something what we learned before go live. So that was something very, very helpful. Um, cross department training, again, it's very important that even though it's a warehouse management system, we have a complete different ERP system, which our customer care and our logistics department uses. It is very important for them also to have an awareness what the WMS system is, what information you can get, how you can pull those reports. So that is something which is very important. So cross-training is something which is very important. Um, with that, yes, um, now I would like to hand over the slide to Mr. Emmanuel, if you guys have any questions. Yes, well, thank you very much, Harish. Let's bring everybody on now because we're going to take some questions from the audience. And even as we are answering the questions that have already come in, audience members are encouraged to continue to submit those questions, your own questions, and we will get to them as many as we can, time permitting. Let me start out with this one uh, for Emmanuel. The questioner says, you mentioned cloud adoption is rising. Have you seen a preference for cloud WMS deployments to use a multi-tenant or single-tenant approach and why? Yeah, um, this is, uh, I mean, clearly a very interesting discussion because they have different philosophy or different ways of looking at this. Uh, we at Generate's group, I was about, I mean, I mentioned seventy percent of adoption uh, of new customer at, at Genetics. It's eighty percent. Eighty percent of all the new uh, accounts that we're deploying right now are SaaS. Our approach always been a single tenant, leveraging the latest of uh, technology on the Amazon Web Services. Uh, most of our clients are running distribution network considered operational critical, so having their own instance on the cloud versus sharing. A uh, common instance and a common database, it's preferred. Give them a little bit more control on the update schedule, uh, more control also in terms of performance scalability, more configuration control. So those are advent of example of advantages of a single tenant. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, this questioner says that you mentioned automation as a big trend. What about voice technology? Does voice appear to hold the same promise it did in the future, given these new options? Yeah, it's still popular. And uh, I mean, uh, for operation where you have, you know, eaches and case picking when you need your two hands, uh, voice is, is, uh, is definitely a technology that is uh, common. 
what has changed is is the uh, you know traditional voice system used to be a standalone system that was running in parallel with the WMS that needed a lot of in system interfaces. Uh, you needed to train the system also uh, as you know everybody that were using the system. So it was like uh, uh, clearly uh, more costly in terms of initial buying and more costly in terms of configuration, more complex, and also in terms of maintenance. Today's voice technology is 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 a more a lot is is uh, simpler. Uh, the way we do it with modern WMS, it's actually embedded in the WMS. So it's really an option that is available as part of any mobile workflow process where you can activate voice uh, and uh, provide voice recognition, okay? So uh, it's by being embedded in the system, it's clearly less costly, easier to configure, do not require that much system interface. So it just makes all this more easy. Uh, and uh, uh, allows you also more uh, flexibility in terms of example, when you do voice uh, for picking, very often a combination of voice instruction, voice recognition, and still being able to scan, okay? Example, if you're scanning a part with a serial number, it's not a good idea to say this and have the system to recognize a 10 digits long serial number. It's a lot faster to scan. So you'll have voice instruction, voice recognition and a mix of scanning. So voice and scan type of. Well, yeah, program. it's it's good to hear that uh, new technology doesn't necessarily supplant old technology, that these things can all work together in some way or another. Uh, this questioner is saying, talking about employee attraction, engagement, retention, all of which have become a critical business requirement. How can a WMS help address this issue? Yeah. Yeah, we mentioned how difficult it is now to, you know, finding the right labor and keeping the labor, engaging the labor. So clearly, uh, I mean, WMS, traditional WMS used to be a lot about planning and tracking the task, okay? So rigid labor standard were used in order to uh, organize and supervise. That was the, the, the vision, okay? Now today, uh, you, you want to track, you want to engage, you want to retain employees. So a new generation of WMS slash labor management system need to be fun to use, okay? So it's about intuitive graphical interface. It's about easy, easy to learn. It's about engaging uh, with team targets, engaging with individual achievement, gratification. Uh, there's a term out there called gamification. So it's really about, you know, the WMS being, yes, optimizing the task, but also interact as a user, you want to have more fun ways of using WMS uh, with all kinds of gratification and gamification uh, uh, goodies. That's a great point you make, Emmanuel, considering especially it's an interesting response to the labor shortage we're certainly currently facing in warehouses. Just trying to get people to work in these facilities, that certainly is a good way to help attract them to make the job more interesting and fun and attractive rather than these super strict labor performance standards that we saw in previous years. Um, yeah. This last, the next question uh, kind of picks up on the whole issue of people as well. For all the talk about technology, we always seem to end up talking about people, don't we? The question is, what are some of the key skill sets, technical and soft skills, are organizations looking at when hiring new talent within the warehouse segment? Yeah. Uh, I mean, definitely, I will say that, uh, you know, example, uh, you still need things like, you know, people that uh, are hard worker, uh, rigorous in terms of how they do things. You know, in the warehouse, I always say one of very important ingredients is, is discipline of how you do things. You know, it takes one guy that doesn't know what he's doing that can really mix up inventory if he's doing uh, crazy things for an hour. So, but clearly, as we said, new system that are more engaging. You want people that want to be working as a team. Okay, so teamwork is becoming very, very key. Uh, and also people that are a bit technology savvy. Why? We mentioned about flexibility, configurability now, as you know, a new WMS that are available out there. 
And really what you want is those tools that allow you to be, to configure and adapt the system. You don't want to rely on the IT department. You want to rely on your own team. You want your team, people, operational people that are tech savvy a bit to being able to create that new report, create that new labels, create that new dashboard, okay? Or modify a workflow, okay? So a mix of, people that really are good at terms of warehouse operation and also comfortable with technology so they can own those tools and pretty much you know, be agile on a day-to-day -day basis, modifying, making the system evolve. Well, thank you for that. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time. We have time for just one final question and I'm going to direct it to Emmanuel and here it is. The question is as follows. The slide that states that WMS will evolve more in the next five years than it did in the last 25 is a powerful message. What does this mean for the businesses that have already deployed a WMS and for those that have not? Yeah. Uh, and clearly, uh, status quo is not an option anymore. You know, we, either if you're using a WMS or you're currently uh, looking for a new WMS, you need to be aware and, and knowledgeable about the, the the, the, the new technology that are available. So, you know, when I meet people that tell me that, oh, there's no need for to change anything in my warehouse operation, I'm like, wow, really? <laughs> no? All my successful customers that has, you know, acknowledged a lot of growth lately, they always in a constantly looking for new opportunities right, for continuous improvement, but also to address challenges. For example, when we mentioned labor shortage, so they always looking out there. What's available? New technology. They always try to see. Oh, is there value for us to to adapt that technology? So uh, when you look, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, analytics, microservices, highly configurable WMS framework. Those are technology that are deployed in today's operation in today's warehouse. Okay. So my recommendation will be to set up a, a warehouse innovation committee. Okay. Explore what is out there. Uh, events like Promat in Chicago next March, which is the largest logistic trade show in North America, is a good place to be and, and, and learn and see what's available in technology. So this is a good way of, you know, understanding what's out there. So definitely Generics Group will be present as an exhibitor and also uh, as a, a, a speaker. And it will be nice to see you out there. Oh, thank you for that. I wonder if the criticality of this presentation could be summed up best by a remark that Harish made about how customers understand, but he put the word understand in quotes, meaning that no, they don't. They really don't tolerate service failures. And what you're talking about today really helps you to understand how warehouses can meet the demands of customers today. So I want to thank you all for that. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I uh, want to thank our, our speakers. And here's how you can contact them all. There's their emails. Uh, you can do it that way, or you can meet them in person at Promat 2023 in Chicago, Illinois, from March 20th to 23rd. So drop by and talk to them. I'm sure that this conversation will can continue in a very valuable way. So I do want to thank Emmanuel Langlois of Generix Group, Harish Kumar of Emblem Logistics, and Aaron LeBlanc of TLS for a fantastic presentation Audience members also, thank you for your attendance and for your excellent questions. To everybody, have happy holidays, stay well, have a great day.